Coming up, faculty speak out. I'm itching to get back on campus for sure, but I don't look good on a ventilator. And the best experience for the students will be if I'm not dead. Teaching from home, some faculty look to hold their classes remotely. Will they really have the choice? These mixed messages are confusing and they raise anxiety. Unclear policy. The university's communication this summer confuses and unsettles faculty. The messages they've received. It does provide pressure. Under pressure, why faculty might put fears about their health aside and instead teach in person. Who is the most vulnerable? Radically different. Faculty designing courses without critical information. We needed to start designing this curriculum last month. The answers they need. Decisions made. Reopening plans driven by admin. Faculty left behind. What we were trying to do is, is advance the interests of the faculty. How much did faculty impact SU's plans? Questioning priorities. It hasn't started from a position of what's the safest thing to do. Professors openly wonder where the university's priorities lie, what they think is really driving the university's decisions. And expecting the worst, but hoping for the best. Professors offer a sobering opinion of if an outbreak will force SU online. It's gonna be inevitable. Are faculty prepared? A Citrus TV News special report starts right now. Hi, I'm Ricky Sayer. Over the past month, we've spent over 10 hours speaking with more than 15 Syracuse University professors. Originally, we were looking to get a better picture at what the semester will look like for students amid the pandemic. Instead, what we found is a mix of confused and frustrated faculty. A top concern, can they choose to work from home? In a statement, a university spokesperson said, Syracuse University will not ask our faculty to do anything that will jeopardize their well-being or the well-being of an at-risk family member. But that same message wasn't made clear to all the faculty we spoke with. Faculty told us the communication they did receive put pressure on them to teach from campus. The confusion traced back to a series of puzzling emails and shifting messages. Most of the faculty we spoke with for this story wouldn't speak to us on the record out of anxiety or fear of reprisal. Some did, and you'll hear from them over the next 40 minutes. We'll start with why the teach from home policy is such a central worry. As the Syracuse campus races toward a fall reopening, professors are raising concerns. I'm itching to get back on campus for sure, but I don't look good on a ventilator. And the best experience for the students will be if I'm not dead. Newhouse professor Greg Heisler says he won't come back to campus until there is a coronavirus vaccine. He sure students won't follow social distancing guidelines while they are off campus, meaning that lecture halls simply won't be safe. I think it's just fingers crossed, wishful thinking, magical thinking, and I just think it's silly. They know better. So, Heisler will get to teach from home, making his photography class as engaging as he can. He's been given the official go-ahead after filing a request. It's not just Heisler. Multiple other faculty members we spoke with want to teach from home for the same reason. They declined to speak on camera. During a virtual faculty meeting, Heisler made his intention known in the chat. I think I said, I love teaching here. I treasure my students. I'm not coming back in the fall on campus. And literally within two seconds, the kind of responses you can get that say private, from at least two other faculty, one said amen, and the other one said thanks for taking a stand. So, and these aren't people who are buddies of mine. Crystal Bartolovich is the president of the Syracuse chapter of the American Association of University Professors. She told us in an email that most faculty members she's spoken with are on the other side, wanting to teach in person. Corin Claver is one of them. I am comfortable. I am comfortable because I'm gonna wear masks, Still, Bartolovich says her organization has held firm that faculty members should be the sole decider, giving them the final call in choosing to teach on campus or from home. However, an initial university policy emailed on June 9th to deans and some faculty left a different impression. It reads, The general expectation is that most faculty members will provide in-person classroom instruction. A faculty member may request to teach exclusively online for fall 2020 if they or someone with whom they cohabitate has conditions that put them at greater risk for illness due to exposure to COVID-19. 
that was merely a request. It wasn't even saying it would be granted, it was saying you could put in a request. The university told faculty to send in those teach from home requests by June 17th. Multiple professors said they were concerned the policy was being interpreted differently across campus. And as Claver, who just became the chair of the English department in arts and sciences said, The emails were confusing. Based on that first email, faculty believed they could only teach from home if they or a family member had a certifiable medical reason. No relief for healthy faculty concerned about COVID exposure. Others concerned they need to reveal sensitive medical information to get their approval. Days after the email, faculty members started hearing conflicting messages. In an arts and sciences meeting, Claver heard that faculty can make that decision. But it doesn't appear all colleges sent that exact same message. As Heiser understood it, in Newhouse, there's a flexible guideline where if you are 65 or older or have a health condition listed as high risk by the CDC, they could request they teach from home. Heiser is 66 and he says he's been given the go-ahead. Faculty we spoke with in other schools did not hear the same guidelines. College of Engineering and Computer Science Dean J. Cole Smith said individual colleges have some discretion to interpret university policy. Smith told us the policy in his school is as follows. Faculty were asked to say if they needed to offer their classes in 100% online mode back in mid-June. The guidance at the time was that this needed to be because of a heightened vulnerability to COVID-19. We did not ask for what that vulnerability was. We also let our faculty know that they could request to teach online only as circumstances changed. Smith confirmed some requests to teach from home were not fully approved. He said almost all requests were approved. When they were not, I simply had a discussion with the faculty member to see which classes they did not want to teach in person, and if we could salvage in-person instruction for some of their other classes. We reached an agreement without any problem. We can't confirm if the faculty member he's referring to felt the same way. During a Senate meeting in June, a senator complained about a message sent to faculty in the College of Visual and Performing Arts. These mixed messages are confusing and they raise anxiety. An email from VPA Dean Michael Tick sent to his college's faculty outlines how they hope to accommodate requests to teach exclusively online. The email adds language onto the initial teach from home guidance sent to deans. It says all requests will be treated with respect and with the understanding that faculty have a compelling reason to make the request. Hamner read from the email. Quote, although we hope to accommodate all requests, and he meant uh, requests exclusively online, to teach exclusively online, quote, we can't guarantee them without knowing what our portfolio of offerings will look like. To be clear, the university has a goal of wanting the vast majority of classes being offered with at least some in-person content, unquote. The email also says chairs and school directors must finalize fall 2020 course scheduling to ensure that the majority of the courses in VPA will include in-person instruction. In an email to us, Dean Tick said, professors are most certainly allowed to work from home if they would like to do so. We sent him the text of his email asking faculty to produce a compelling reason if they wanted to work from home and asked if the policy had been relaxed. Tick claimed that from the very beginning, VPA left the decision to teach in person, online, or hybrid to our faculty, who have worked tirelessly to plan for the fall semester and beyond. VPA faculty members told Citrus TV they never saw a follow-up email laying out that policy. After faculty pushed back, Bartolovich said administrators significantly softened their position over time. But across the university, it often fell on department chairs like Corin Claver to communicate that. Because it, at least in my department, it's clear. <laughs> the message was also communicated in a series of virtual webinars with different colleges across campus. After sitting in on those meetings, some professors told us they left with a new understanding of the university's policy. No longer would they need a specified medical condition to be able to teach from home. They could make the decision on their own and make that decision when they wanted to. We have had two faculty members since the deadline change their mind and say, okay, I'm just going to teach online. Others didn't come away with the same understanding. That was surprising. It was a little unclear. Many faculty didn't attend any of the live webinars and were left in the dark. As a result, faculty members' understanding of the policy is still different depending on who you ask. Concerned faculty members 
pushed for an emergency meeting of the university senate. So we'll try to get in as many more comments and questions as we can. That meeting would force administrators to hear out professors' concerns and give administrators a chance to respond. They are usually publicly held in Maxwell Hall, but like so much else, it took place virtually. A faculty member sharing a recording of the June 24th meeting with us. Uh, what policies has SU put in place or begun to develop uh, that will help protect and monitor the effects of our institution upon the health of uh, City of Syracuse residents. I have a couple of questions about quarantine. We're not really sure who's driving this particular bus, and part of the issue is because it does seem to span so many facets of SU. So help. Faculty quite literally pleading for help. During the meeting, Professor M. Gail Hamner called for a university-wide written policy that clarifies that every faculty member and graduate TA may discern which teaching modality is best for them personally and pedagogically, no questions asked. The university eventually updated their frequently asked questions to say the decision to teach in the fall is yours and yours alone if you or a family member has conditions putting you at greater risk due to exposure to COVID-19. According to that original June 9th email, faculty members could go through an appeals process with the university if their request was denied. A university spokesperson said no appeals have been filed. Bartolovich said that after receiving mixed messaging early, the university's position is now clearer. But despite the increased clarity, faculty still feel there are elements of the university's message that is pressuring them to teach from campus. We found out what's keeping them from teaching at home. Amid confusion, university leaders used the Senate meeting and college webinars to clear things up. When asked by Professor Hamner about the faculty teach from home policy, Provost John Liu told senators to make the decision that is best for them. In my mind, there's absolutely no confusion. We're not going to force anybody to come to teach one way or the other. It's your decision. But many faculty members say that statement didn't reassure them. They might not be forced to come in, but they heard Lou say something that implied they should come in. The general expectation is that we will provide the majority of our instruction with an in-person component. The general expectation is that the majority of classes will include an in-person component. The two messages often seen together. That's how it's written in that original June 9th email, as well as the university's FAQ. A university spokesperson repeated that general expectation in a message to us. It's a statement which multiple faculty said was repeated in college-level virtual webinars. Some saying administrators added the word vast before majority, just like how VPA Dean Tech used it in an email to his faculty. Heisler heard it too. Yeah, I think there is mixed messaging. I think the clear statement was, we expect faculty to be on campus. That's pretty unequivocal. And then later on, 45 minutes later, another statement was made, which was, faculty are able to choose. They'll be, they'll have, they will be able to choose. Heisler is concerned with how the university's messaging could end up pressuring some faculty to teach face-to-face. -face. It sounded like, A, we're kind of really expecting everybody to be back, and B, but if you feel like you really can't do that, you won't feel safe, then certainly we'll, we'll, we'll understand that and we'll, we'll grant that. Heisler believes pressure is falling hardest on professors who are on tenure track, professors of practice, and adjunct faculty, all faculty members whose future employment isn't guaranteed. They don't want to be the ones to poop out. Like, they're, they're up for tenure, or they will be. They're not going to be want, want to be seen as the people who sort of, you know, didn't didn't save the ship. Heisler, who is a full-time professor, does not have tenure himself. Off camera, we spoke to multiple other non-tenured faculty members who felt the university was pressuring them to come teach on campus. The newly installed English department chair shares some of the same concerns. And there's this kind of moral and ethical imperative. Professor Corin Claver says the university is trying to convince faculty to teach from campus helping them to reach their goal of having most faculty members teach at least some of their classes in person. But I do think it, it, it does provide pressure, especially for those who are more vulnerable. She said that could include junior faculty or part-time teaching assistants. People who need contract renewals and who need to stay on the good side. 
Many tenure track faculty members work off three year contracts. For other faculty members, that length is much shorter, even just a single semester. Drama professor Ricky Pack believes adjuncts are particularly at risk. A lot of adjuncts might be in the mind frame of saying, okay, I need this job in order to get this job. I need to toe that company line of making sure that I do everything I can to make as much of my class in person so that I can keep that job. Being invited back, especially now, is far from guaranteed. I mean, let alone the fact that a lot of those adjunct classes are probably just going to go away. Pack believes this could further increase the pressure on adjuncts. I feel like students in the fall are going to only take the classes that they absolutely need to take, as opposed to any classes that might be extracurricular. Claver says Zoom meetings with administrators have helped ease the pressure, but she believes it may not be enough. So even though we're saying, there, even though the administration is saying there is no consequence, you know, everybody needs to make their choice, um, when your future depends on other people's assessment of you and you are being asked by the, the powers that be to do this if you feel comfortable, right? If you can find your way to feeling comfortable, you're more likely to push those boundaries. Syracuse University did not directly respond to our questions asking if it was their intent to pressure or persuade any faculty to teach in person. They referred us back to an earlier statement which said the university wouldn't penalize faculty in any way for making the decision that is best for them and their family. The university also didn't respond to a question asking if they would implement any concrete policies to protect adjunct and part-time faculty who choose to request to work from home. Those policies could protect part-time faculty who are concerned their decision to teach online could impact who is rehired for the next semester. In the Senate meeting, faculty repeated their call for more clarity. Given how much we do not know about the long-standing effects of this virus, even on young people who get mild symptoms, we still don't have an explicit statement that no member of our community will be pressured to be on campus if their work or their um, you know, what they can do can be completed virtually. As of July 30th, a university spokesperson told us that at the moment, we wouldn't be able to interview senior administration officials for this story. During that Senate meeting, the chancellor responded to Professor Ferry saying administrators had done their job. We, we've let, and I, I think appropriately, let faculty form their own judgments about what format to teach in. Bartolovich said many faculty worry SU hasn't prepared for one very real possibility. Faculty may not want to or be able to teach on campus, but because so many are on the fence, push hasn't come to shove. We are committed to providing uh, students with a residential experience. And if a whole department is not offering classes, you know, it's not going to offer any of its classes in resident, a residential component for their classes, then that's not going to be good. Already, some faculty have been told that if they do want to teach in person, they would only be able to be in class with half of their students at a time. An arts and sciences faculty member received this email from the registrar's office, which says, all in-person classes this fall will be half and half, half in person with the other half of the class online. We will not have classes meeting with everyone in the room at the same time. In the university Senate meeting chat, professors were concerned about how much of an on-campus experience students would actually get. Professor Brian Sheehan wrote, If a key goal is for them to get in-person instruction, that is not realistic. If 70% of students come back, and if, on average, two of their five classes are only available online, and if they can only attend half of those classes, flex model, and teachers are employing asynchronous for a percentage of these classes, then the average student will get about 10 to 15% of their learning in person. Citrus TV emailed every college's dean in early July. We asked for the percentage of classes which would be taught in person at their college. Three colleges provided data. Newhouse gave it to students before our request was made. Across these colleges, the data showed the majority of classes would include some in-person element. 
The amount, though, varied. On July 17th, in the span of 10 minutes, we received emails from two deans. Both said we should not use the data they had sent us for this story. In less than 10 days, the VPA dean said the statistics had become inaccurate. The education school dean said the information was dynamic and evolving. We presented both of them the opportunity to give us updated data, and asked if there were suddenly more classes being taught online. Without providing the data, the education dean said they had movement in both directions. She said, in discussions with my dean colleagues, we have agreed that reporting school by school information is not productive and tends to pit one school or dean against another. That is not what we are about. We are one university and we collaborate. Faculty members told us that in recent weeks, their colleagues have increasingly moved to teach online. Dean J. Cole Smith said in early July that he expected their numbers to shift. At the same time, he said a large shift would shock him. As COVID cases spike across the country and more faculty choose to teach online, it's still unclear whether the university will reach their goal of a real residential semester. For faculty members, the decision to teach online or in person comes with a commitment. It could mean creating a whole new curriculum, and some faculty say they don't have the information they need to do that. We spoke to one professor in early July who is in search of answers. What are the rules for what students can do when they're working uh, together in person? Walter Freeman has taught astronomy for years at Syracuse University, but COVID-19 changed everything, including his class. All of that work, I'm, I'm proud of much of it, but all of that's going to need to be changed, right? Because I'm going to be teaching a very different sort of class this fall. He says teaching this fall in person will be radically different and there's no shot they get into their observatory. Uh, we're going to need to design new curricula. We're going to need to design new methods of teaching. Uh, we're going to need to write new materials. You're saying you need to start designing this curriculum now. We needed to start designing this curriculum last month. But doing that with so little information is difficult. When we spoke over Zoom, there was a lot he didn't know. Uh, where will we be meeting? What can we do once we get there? Who will we be meeting with? And who else will we be serving who's not there in person? Where will they be? What time zones will they be? Freeman quickly listed off a dozen specific questions he is hoping to get answered. He needs more information from SU to redesign his courses. But when we first spoke to him, he said one of the only things he knows for sure is revised classroom capacities. We know in broad strokes what we are allowed to do. So we, we cannot have students see it sit closer than six feet to each other. Freeman gave us an update on August 1st. He says the SU registrar has moved some of their classes into larger spaces, but not all. Freeman says his discussion section is still scheduled for what he calls a tiny room where social distancing is impossible. It's a problem across the physics department. The department has taken it upon themselves to spread out some students across classrooms, meaning a student's schedule wouldn't be reflective of where their class is actually held. Syracuse University did not respond to questions about this topic. Their FAQ does say faculty members know themselves and their classes best, so they can be creative in finding approaches that work best for the content and their students. We really need to have some standardized guidance from somebody in the university at the top or close to the top. During the university senate meeting, Professor Ann Mosher shared her own concerns. Her specific issue, a lack of guidance about schoolwork that takes place off campus. Because we're starting to, um, depending upon what networks we're tapped into, we're starting to come up with these really local solutions and standards. And I think some of us are starting to get a little bit concerned that all of this variability um, and how we're mitigating and assessing risk to our students and to the community um, is, is not going to have a good result. The university is encouraging faculty to explore their ideas by engaging with the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence. The university is also offering these resources to faculty. Bartolovich told us in late June, lots of us want to know what particular classrooms we have been assigned as well and what conditions of instruction would be. Without exact specifications, Freeman is preparing to hold his discussion sections outside. The university says they will build tents. And we want them to be the best damn classes we can offer. Um, we need 
time and information to do that. Freeman is far from the only professor with a lot of questions. The university has provided them some answers in a series of webinars with colleges across campus. But faculty members were unhappy with how those webinars were formatted and the public message the university spread about them. And uh, this was done, I believe, for Newhouse. Uh, so they could basically tell us what's going on and we'd have the opportunity to ask some questions. Now the university's communication about these events have called them meetings. Multiple professors we spoke with took issue with that. Due to the webinar format, only administrators and a moderator could speak. Five people who attended the Newhouse webinar told us the chat was disabled. Two professors described the information coming out of the meeting as either highly controlled or managed. At the end of the day, they said it was not informative. Bartolovich called them frustrating. She attended the Arts and Sciences webinar and said some questions were ignored. She says they were, quote, censored in the sense that the one person who read them out did so. They did not read them out word for word, and that necessarily changed some of the questions a lot. Bartolovich said she asked a question about releasing the results of athletes' COVID-19 testing. She says the moderator failed to read aloud her list of reasons explaining why it would be important for the university to release that information. It gives the illusion of concern, the illusion of completely beyond the case, and the illusion of we're all ears. And I just don't think any of those things is the case. And I think they, I think they know it. They do. Starting July 10th, the university started holding weekly virtual updates. The university's website says during these meetings, administrators will be able to answer questions and address concerns of community members about returning to campus and elicit feedback and suggestions. To give you a couple numbers, uh, an inventory now of, of more than 3 million disposable masks, 35,000 re re uh, reusable masks. In these webinars, chat was once again disabled. The only questions people could see are the ones they asked. With less than three weeks to go before the semester, interim provost John Liu began hosting a series of three listening sessions with faculty. Bartolovich told us administrators' webinars with individual colleges should have come earlier so that faculty feedback could be used to make major decisions. Faculty say they should have more seats at the table. For decisions impacting what happens inside the classroom, they say they know what's best. Bartolovich is criticizing the university for forming working groups to plan for the fall semester entirely outside of the university senate. She says the academic strategy group is a major issue. It deals with instruction, which Bartolovich says faculty traditionally governs. We made a lot of recommendations that went to the provost's office and went out to different schools and colleges so that the different schools and colleges could use our recommendations in order to make their own plans. That's Aileen Gallagher, a faculty member on the committee. She says they discussed what types of classes could be offered in person and how space would be allocated. As she put it, the academic piece of reopening. What we were trying to do is, is advance the interests of the faculty. Faculty were outnumbered. The university provided data to the Syracuse American Association of University Professors. They posted the data online. On the academic strategy subcommittee, out of 25 total members, seven were faculty. That doesn't include department chairs or deans. Making up the majority of slots on the subcommittee are deans and other administrators. Do you wish there were more faculty on the committee? I wish there were more faculty on every committee. The university's working group has nine subcommittees, touching on subjects from health and safety to the student experience. The university's frequently asked questions page says that more than 120 faculty and staff have been engaged in the fall 2020 open working group. We found there are just 16 faculty members who sit on physical committees. They make up a small portion of the working group's 126 listed participants. Most people on the committee are university administrators, directors, department chairs, deans, and other staff members. They fill out the group's 150 total positions. There's somewhat of a disconnect, uh, and, and all, you know, all deans are former faculty members, so they certainly have uh, faculty experience. However, they, they're not, that's not their main part of their job anymore. Bartolovich complained about how admin heavy the working groups are. The timing of when faculty were added to working groups is also an issue. She said faculty were added to subcommittees after major decisions had been made. We asked Gallagher if that was correct. At the time I joined the committee, there was a draft of their report already. Do you believe you were able to significantly shape what became the final report? 
The faculty on our committee worked hard to advocate for faculty perspectives. Um, we did create opportunities for more faculty voices through a series of focus groups so that there was a lot of faculty feedback in the report that was really important. And I think we did raise some issues maybe that um, uh, higher level administrators had not thought of just again because of that disconnect between them and the classroom. Bartolovich said faculty were forced to undo the decisions made before they joined the group. When we asked her if faculty's late entry to the working group lowers her confidence of a successful semester from an academic standpoint, she said, I am sure that no matter what, faculty will do their best for students, even if from our point of view, admin has made this more difficult and taxing than it should have been by not including us from the start in the decision making. They can say, well, this is a crisis, so we had to do it this way. But it's a, but they've been doing this stuff this way for a long time. And then when you have a crisis, you just, it's like you, re, you dig in to what you've always been doing. You turn back to what you know. Some professors believe the university is reopening this fall for the wrong reasons. Professors we spoke with say the real reason couldn't be more clear. Amidst the pandemic, the university raised tuition by thousands of dollars. Gallagher asked Chancellor Siverud about it in the Newhouse webinar. So I asked him that since he had acknowledged the great financial strain that this situation is putting on everyone, um, why had the university raised tuition, especially when many of our peer institutions froze tuition this year? Gallagher says the chancellor responded by saying that it was a board of trustees decision, one that he supported. Um, and said generally, and I'm, and I'm really paraphrasing here, but generally that uh, sometimes leaders make unpopular decisions. But it was something else the chancellor said that turned a few heads. Three people who attended the webinar said they recalled the chancellor saying the university relies more heavily on tuition revenue in comparison to our peer institutions. It helped support Heisler's own belief about where the university's own priorities lie. I hate to say that, but I feel like the focus is more on the financial health of the institution rather than the physical health of the student staff and faculty, that that would come. They don't wish anyone to be sick. They're keeping their little fingers and toes crossed that everybody's okay, as we all are. But it's just sort of like, well, we have to do this. We can't not do it. Three other faculty members we spoke with agreed. It's why Heisler believes the university is focused on having most faculty teach from campus. However, the majority of people we spoke with disagreed with Heisler about the university's focus. I wouldn't put it that way. Bartolovich caught it too harsh, but added that faculty find it frustrating that administrators won't admit how financial pressures impact their decisions. Last week, we obtained this email from Vice Chancellor Haney, which refers to students and their parents as customers. The email, which was sent to deans, reads, I know you are getting questions about fall open implementation and are we ready, most often coming from the uninvolved. In my view, what matters most is what our customer believes, that is, our students and their parents. Gallagher understands why the university would want to be open. The university's concern about student safety is strong, if only because what good is the school if there are no students? So that's certainly a priority that was very clear going all the way through. Gallagher says that like other universities which are tuition dependent, if students stop paying tuition, it puts the school in jeopardy. And tuition isn't the only problem. There's room and board too. That's a large amount of our operating budget. Based on Syracuse University's average cost of a half year of room and board, multiplied by roughly the number of underclassmen, who are nearly all required to live on campus, Syracuse stands to lose at least $62 million if classes move online and students are refunded room and board. With the number of students who would take a gap semester, that amount would likely rise. SU, like other institutions, is threading a very difficult needle in that they're balancing uh, public health and safety concerns with uh, the need to uh, generate revenue, in this case through tuition and room and board, uh, in order to keep the university open and functioning. The university did not respond to questions about the topic, 
which included if they would admit there is a financial pressure to have students on campus this fall. Instead, they referred us back to an earlier statement shared with us which said, the health and safety of our campus community is our chief priority. In the Senate meeting, Interim Provost John Liu said, Our shared goal is to maximize student experience while minimizing health and safety risk of our faculty, staff, and students. Administrators have repeatedly stated that an in-person semester is what students want. But is an in-person semester what's best? Like last spring, campus would be quiet this fall if Professor Heisler had his way. He says the university could have been a national leader by being one of the first to announce a completely online fall semester. People won't like it. Students won't like it. The parents won't like it. People won't like it. That would be the safest thing to do. We've seen nothing, even just as entertaining, what could that be? What might that look like? For Heisler, making the issue worse is that SU won't require faculty to be tested for the coronavirus. During the university senate meeting, Vice Chancellor Mike Caney said testing would only be voluntary. The reason we're not requiring it is the majority of our, of our faculty and staff live and reside here in central New York. Heisler characterized that decision to not test all faculty as negligent. All of the effort that they're going to, and they're going to great expense and effort for sure, it's all moot if there are giant gaps. Not having any of the faculty tested, is, is it because it's a privacy thing? Heisler says that if the university was putting health first, they would be sending clear messages to faculty. To him, health first also means not putting pressure on faculty to teach from campus. The clearest thing to me is that it hasn't started from a position of what's the safest thing to do? And within that, how can we provide the best educational experience for the students? It was more, we've got to open in the fall for sure. What's kind of the safest way we can do that and still open? It's, it's just backwards. It's ass backwards. I hate to say it, but it is. The safety is second. The safety is second. It is. He says they're more worried about avoiding bad press than they are about addressing issues. He wants SU to be honest with students about just how bad things are. So I think that if the school's really worried about bad press, when the first student, God forbid, dies, or the first faculty member dies, or the first 10 people are on a ventilator, that's gonna be bad press. The bad press won't be Syracuse University didn't open in the fall. The bad press will be they decided to open, and now look what happened. And I think that's going to be tough. Uh, I think that we should just be all, all virtual. I think we should just be completely online. And that's really hard saying because, especially in the Department of Drama, it's like so dependent on face to face physical instruction. Multiple faculty members said Vice Chancellor Haney said there would be a number of cases which, if SU tops, would force instruction online. He wouldn't say what it is, but we know from plans submitted to the state that 100 positive cases would put campus on pause for one to four weeks. We don't know for sure what number would put an end to the semester, but Heisler thinks that whatever it is, it won't take too long to reach. Maybe it will start out okay. I do think it will fall away pretty quickly. I do. And you don't need a lot of weak links to have that be a bad thing. Multiple faculty members expressed the same belief. Claver said her confidence level that SU makes it through an entire semester on campus with small outbreaks and a significant amount of hybrid courses is... About 25%. <laughs> and within the small group of faculty Professor Pack has been speaking to this summer... We all feel... Um, that if it's going to be inevitable uh, that we will move into an all online um, uh, curriculum at some point in the semester. Do you think that's inevitable? It's just going to happen at some point? Yeah. I mean, and that's, yeah, that's my just personal opinion, just watching it's what, what's happening, you know, across the country and across the world. Just as soon as um, any sort of um, preventative measures have been lax, uh, brought back, you know, there's two weeks later, there's, there's huge outbreaks. Syracuse University is the country's top party school, known for big events like juice jam, tailgates, and of course, house parties. Faculty don't think the university's social compact can stop events like this from happening off campus, at least not completely. For them, it's a given that when some students leave campus, 
Social distancing will leave with them, endangering the entire Syracuse community. They, they know what the real deal is. We can't expect a three-year-old to act like a seven-year-old. We can't expect a 20-year-old to act like a 40-year-old. In the June University Senate meeting, Assistant Provost Amanda Nicholson wouldn't commit to saying how they plan to enforce the university's rules, saying they still need to finalize it. If someone forgets to put their mask up as they as they walk or pulls their mask down for some reason as they're walking across the quad, that's a totally different thing than someone hosting a huge party in a frat house, right? I mean, so there's there's this levels of this. The latter would be immediate suspension. I mean, we we will. That's all I can tell you. Already, the university's ZBT fraternity has been suspended for violating social distancing guidelines last spring. Just last week, DPS officers were seen investigating a party that took place off campus. Ripping party yesterday? There was a party last yesterday. Last night? There was, not there. No, where was it? That house next door. Oh. It wasn't that house. It was at 220. It wasn't there. It wasn't there? All right, so it's next door. I'm at the wrong house. PhD student Nicholas Croce sent us that video along with this photo, which he says shows officers opening up a neighbor's mailbox, trying to figure out if SU students live there. A resident at the house where the party took place told us that's what an officer asked them. They said they told the officer they are Lemoyne students. In recent weeks, Nicholson said they would be patrolling off campus to monitor students who may gather or have parties. Last Friday, she had a DPS would be responsible for patrolling, but didn't specifically say they are looking for students who gather. At the same time, when it comes to properly quarantining off campus, officials say it is on the honor system. Students simply asked to affirm they followed the quarantine using this form. It's not just the off campus experience that could take a hit. Inside classrooms, Heisler is worried about the hybrid strategy as a whole. Is all the stress worth it? There is no doubt classrooms will look different this fall. To allow for social distancing, many classes will be left half full. So you're basically teaching two different kinds of things to two different groups of people. And it's, it's not like it can't be done. It's just that is a diminished experience. It's a diminished experience for the students in a big way. Claver has similar beliefs. Not only is teaching in person and virtual at the same time difficult, she won't be able to break her class into small groups. It might be actually better to use Zoom because then you can use the Zoom modalities of breakout groups to do the kind of work you want to do in the classroom, right? Freeman said his department has increasingly realized that restrictions on what they can do in the classroom will mean that holding class online will be better. And I think this whole thing could be a big lesson where it's actually like, you know what? We really want you to have the great experience. This isn't going to be it. Heisler says students might come to campus, see the measures that are in place, and then decide it isn't worth it. Or they might say to their parents, I'm, I'm sad, I hate this, it's not good. I don't know how it's going to go, I don't. But I think that people will be really disappointed. And again, my the bottom, bottom of the bottom line is, I really think that secretly the administration is hoping that they won't have to make the call, that the government will make the call that everybody's got to close down. And then it'll be like, dodge the bullet. Heisler says the university could have made the call on their own, giving faculty more time to prepare for what he believes will likely end up as an online semester anyway. Ricky Pack agreed. If we just made that decision, then it would cut so many variables. I, I, you know, I, would, I would be able to plan for one curriculum as opposed to a curriculum that has to have multiple backdoor exits just in case there's an outbreak. So, so it essentially gives you more time to make a better virtual product yes. for students. Yeah. Professor Gallagher also believes it's probable that students get sick and the university or at least specific classes will have to shift to remote learning. Multiple faculty agreed. Gallagher sat on the working group subcommittee, which made teaching recommendations. We asked her if the university is sufficiently prepared for remote learning or if more focus should be put on it. But I do think that most faculty members are anticipating uh, that it is entirely possible that at least some of their class, some of their semester will be spent remote, might happen multiple times. So you plan for that and then you can layer in um, the students in the room 
a lot easier than if you're only planning the, for the students in the room and then trying to layer in the remote. So you think we'll be sufficiently prepared? I think faculty are working really hard to prepare because they want to be good teachers. Heisler says faculty are doing their best to make the online experience a good one. He says the changes they are making could improve classes for years to come. It's an unexpected silver lining is everybody's really got to devote some very serious attention to the online class, the online experience. As long as professors are prepared to move online, there will be no last minute scramble and he says classes won't suffer. And we will find a way to, to have high quality instruction with our students in whatever form uh, we have. Freeman says this will be a hard semester because of so many uncertainties, but he believes the students faculty and staff can and will figure it out together. One of the things that I've seen in my five and a half years at Syracuse University is that if you take dedicated, inspired students and uh, dedicated, hardworking faculty, and you put them together, whether together it means in an office, outside wearing masks, over Zoom, communicating over email, or some other thing that I don't even know about, magic happens. So, even though we might not see each other in person, it doesn't mean all that college magic will all fade away. There's magic that does happen when you're in person. And there's going to be less magic, right, if we're all online. But that doesn't mean that everyone is going to be miserable and no one's going to learn anything. Um, I think an online semester is not ideal. But if we have to fall back to that, then we'll figure it out. We did it once, we'll do it again. There's clearly no crystal ball when it comes to this pandemic. The world could completely change overnight. Faculty forced to change with it. As Freeman put it, don't be too surprised if you see faculty members with a few more gray hairs on the first day of classes this fall after making some last minute changes. And that will wrap up this Citrus TV News special report. For continuing coverage, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and check out our Instagram as well as citrustv.com. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at Citrus TV News, have a good day and stay safe.